So ITIL will give you a set of processes. ITIL will give you a framework. Well, ITIL is a framework for managing services, but it's not a prescriptive framework. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. It's not just plug and play. You need to take the processes that ITIL will advise and you will need to not just adopt them, but adapt them to suit your environment. That's what ITIL is about. It's about delivering value through your services to your organization, but delivering that value efficiently and effectively, which means that we have to have processes in place that are efficient and are effective and relevant for your organization. So where do you start when you're trying to create a process? Well, as I've already said, ITIL's not plug and play. So you can't just take a process out of an ITIL publication, whether it's incident or whether it's change or whether it's problem management, and just expect it to work miraculously in your organization. It's not going to do that. You have to define a process that is relevant for your organization. So let's take a look at the process diagram that's to be found in all of our ITIL publications, but we are first introduced to this in our ITIL foundation and also in our service strategy publication. And this is our process documentation. Now, the first thing that you will see is that it is split into three sections. Uh, the top section being our process control section, um, the middle being the actual process itself, and the bottom being the process enablers. And you will see resources and capabilities, or in other words, our service assets in that bottom section. So where do we start then if we're defining a process? Well, very simply, we start off by allocating, assigning responsibility to a process owner. And that process owner, so this is step number one, if you will. That process owner is the person that takes accountability for ensuring that the process has a policy. Look at that, step number two. And then process has also objectives as well. And that they are documented. So the process owner takes accountability for that. So that's the first person that you have to, or the first step is to allocate the process owner. Give accountability to that person and then they, as a second step, must then define a policy and objectives for process. So let's say, let's say we were working on incident management as a process. So the objective of incident management as defined in the ITIL book, and so this is just an example, you will have to make this relevant for you. You will have to define more specifically what incident management looks like for you. But incident management in the ITIL book, the, that objective of that process is to restore normal service operation as quickly as possible. Okay. So now we've got the process control out of the way, we understand the objectives, the policy will tell us how we're going to do that, how we would work, what type of structure do we have, um, what type of management do we have, do we document absolutely everything in our service management system, do we document it before we start working on the incident, do we document it afterwards, all of those questions, well they should be answered in the policy. So once we have our process control established, you'll notice by the way I haven't mentioned feedback and I'm going to come along to that in a moment. Once we have the process control established, then the first thing that we need to work out, so this could be say step number four, would be our process outputs. What do we want the output from the process to look like? Remember, the objective of the process is to restore normal service operation as quickly as possible. So if we're restoring something, then what is the output going to be? Were the outputs going to be something that's been restored? Yeah, something that's fixed. And if you want to learn a little bit more about incident management, then take a look at the recording that we have of incident versus problem, or you can also take a look at the recording on ITIL service operation as well. That will help with incident management. But we know that the output from incident management is something that's restored or something that's fixed. So that's our next step is then to document and define what a restored service would look like. And now, okay, now we know what the fix should look like. Now we go to look at the process inputs. 
And we're going to get help from people like project man problem management and project management and availability management too, to help us define the inputs. In other words, if the output is something that's been fixed, then the input then is something that's broken, right? So now we start to define the inputs. In other words, what could go wrong? What could break? So now we know what something broken is, looks like, and now we know what something fixed should look like. So we've got to work out how to get from A to B, how to get from broken to fixed. And this is obviously a lot of hard work, but this is where we define the actual activities of the process itself, including all the specific procedures and work instructions that are needed to get from each instance of broken to each instance of fixed. Bearing in mind, there's not just one type of incident. There's not just one type of broken. Oh, my email doesn't work. Okay, but that's not going to be the same resolution or the same fix as, oh, my laptop has just blue screened. That's going to be something completely different. So think about the myriad of things that could go wrong and the plethora of outputs or fixes there could be. You're not just going to have one incident management process. We also have a, a recording on models as well, on process models. Take a look at that. Once we've finished with process definition, take a look at that and it'll help you further with actually being able to assign particular process activities. So that's our next step, to assign the individual activities and the procedures and the work instructions for the process. So now we've got our activities established and we know what the process should look like, what about then, well, measuring the process, making sure that it's working. We know we've got four characteristics of a process. A process has got to deliver value to a stakeholder. A process also has to have a defined output. A process has to be measurable and a process has to respond to a specified trigger. And we'll get on to those in a moment. So we've already looked at the defined output and we obviously know that we've got to create value through this process. So now the metrics then. Well, once we've defined our activities, we also have to think about how we're going to measure whether those activities are working. So is the process doing what it's supposed to do? Now we want to measure the process for both efficiency and for effectiveness. So not just does it do what it's supposed to do, but is it doing it in an, in an efficient way as well? So we define our process metrics next. And then we also look, possibly at the same time as defining the metrics, but I would say let's not try and do everything all at once. We now look at the roles. In other words, who do we need to be able to perform this process? And this is where our bottom section comes into this, and these are our process enablers. Now, if you remember from foundation and also at the beginning of every single ITIL class that you've ever attended, we talk about our service assets and our assets being our capabilities and our resources. Our assets for our processes are exactly the same. These are our resources. These are our tangible assets. Things like our people, the tools that we use, our tangible assets as well, the money that we have is a tangible asset. And then also our capabilities. And our capabilities are our experience. It's how we're organized, who our management are. Okay. So when defining the roles, we should also be defining then the resources and the capabilities. In other words, who do we need and what tools do they need to be able to get from process input to process output? So once we have the roles defined, then we need to take a look at our improvement. Now I said to you a little while ago that I was going to come back to the feedback. Well, yes, I am. The feedback that appears in the top box that we have there, our process feedback, well, there's an arrow going to that, and that's what we might want to call our feedback loop, which is a loop back from the output into feedback, which then feeds directly into process improvements. In other words, it may come out of our metrics, but don't forget the value is perceived, so we might want to survey this. We survey our customers at the end of an incident, don't we? And we ask them, 
was there anything that we could have done better for you? How happy are you with the result? And we should be asking not just how happy they are with the result, but how happy they are with the speed in which we delivered the result. All of this is feedback. And that feedback allows us to implement opportunities for improvement. So this is what we call our feedback loop. Now there's one thing on this particular page that I haven't talked about and that is the trigger. Now I did mention earlier on that processes have four characteristics and one of those characteristics being that all processes have to respond to a trigger. In other words, what starts the process off? Incident management doesn't just happen automatically. Nobody comes along and waves a magic wand and says, hey presto, this is now fixed. Something has to start the process off. It could be automated, it could come from event management, or it could be from a phone call from a user or an email from a user. Or maybe a user automat or a user themselves logs their own incident on your call login system. Whichever one of those it is, these are triggers to the incident management process. So all processes have to have a trigger. So in a nutshell, what we've done is we've just looked at all of the elements that exist within the process, but we've also looked at how you can define your own processes, which is what you will need to do in order to implement a service management framework that is efficient and effective. Now, if you have any queries or any concerns or you'd like any advice on implementing a service management framework or perhaps defining processes, then please feel free to contact me at the email address below.